Welcome to episode 2 of the Gun Tank Historical Series. Today we're going to be discussing the development of the M103 Heavy Tank and its subsequent variants. Now if you haven't seen episode 1 yet, I highly encourage you to go back and catch up. I know it's been a while. Otherwise, the reasoning behind this vehicle's development will be easily lost and honestly, I'd rather not have to explain it again and make this video any longer than it really has to be. In addition, I am using Kenneth Estes' book, M103 Heavy Tank, 1950-1974, as a reference, as well as a few other pieces of primary source documentation that I will list in the description below. Regardless, let us begin. So our story begins with one man in 1944 by the name of General Gladion M. Barnes. His job was head of research and development of U.S. Army ground forces during World War II. Essentially, he was the mad scientist of the lot and spent much of the war advocating the adoption of heavy tanks and all sorts of crazy ideas that the army couldn't give a rat's ass about. Barnes had his fingers in the development of every single piece of equipment the army used right down to the web gear they used and the laces for their boots. This also included, as will no doubt be a surprise to many of us, tanks and armored vehicles. Having advocated for heavier guns and bigger tanks throughout most of the war, Barnes had received stiff opposition from the army, which was perfectly content up until that point to stick with its 35-ton M4 Shermans with its all-purpose 75mm cannon, and the army went into D-Day armed with these vehicles. However, in the coming weeks following June 6th, the army began to encounter more and more Panzerkampfwagen Fünf tanks, also known as Panthers, which proved to be a much tougher nut to crack than the army had initially thought. And while the army had known of the existence of the Panther since the reports sent by the Soviets during the Battle of Kursk, what the army had failed to understand was the fact that the Panther was not just another heavy tank like the Tiger I to be deployed in its own self-contained heavy tank battalions, but it was to become the new standard battle tank of the German army to replace the earlier Panzer IVs that the Sherman with its 75mm gun had proven so effective against. However, thanks to Barnes' efforts, the Army had plenty of 76mm armed Sherman variants waiting in England for deployment to combat units. The first deployments of the 90mm M3 cannon were also arriving in the form of the M36 tank destroyer, and the T26, later known as the Pershing, was just entering its first testing stages. Having been proven somewhat correct that the Army needed something better, Barnes began to face much less resistance from the Army and pushed ahead with a new series of heavy tank programs designed to take on both Panther and the King Tiger. Among these were the T-29 and T-30 heavy tank programs armed with 105mm and 155mm guns respectively, in well-armored turrets weighing close to 70 tons. Barnes wanted to make sure that these vehicles were ready for production just in case the war lasted longer than expected, and as a result obtained approval for production of these projects in September of 1944. However, there were a few hiccups, first of which is the heavy opposition and ultimate rejection of the T-30 heavy tank armed with the T-7 155mm gun, which is effectively a cut-down long tom. The reason for this was quite simple, as the army wasn't so sure about the idea of having even two loaders handling 95-pound 155mm projectiles with 40-pound propellant charges, especially in the confines of a tank turret. As a result, the idea was proposed if the reliable and already available 120mm US anti-aircraft gun could be adapted for tank use. While Barnes continued to viciously ram the T-30 down the Army Ordnance Board's throat, he satiated their request with a new vehicle mounting the 120mm gun designated T-34. To speed its development, Barnes even repurposed two of his T-30 vehicles so as to avoid having to build two brand new hulls. As the battles in the spring of 1945 surged in intensity, Barnes obtained limited production orders for 1,200 T-29s and 500 T-30 heavy tanks to equip specialized heavy tank battalions. Even with the capitulation of Germany in May, the orders for the T-29 were to continue as planned to be used in the invasion of mainland Japan. But with the surrender of the Japanese in September of 1945, the R&D money dried up very quickly and brought almost all of these projects to a sudden halt. After the war had ended, the U.S. took stock of its inventory and declared that all of its current tank forces were obsolete with the exception of the M26 Pershing and the M4A3 medium tanks with wet racks. And in 1946, the U.S. redesignated its vehicles according to weight class and changed the designation of M26 from a heavy tank to medium tank. In addition, the U.S. Marine Corps, which had used diesel-powered Shermans in the Pacific Theater, had also come to the same conclusion under the Commandant of the Marine Corps School Brigadier General O.P. Smith when he said, in general, the tanks with which the Marine divisions ended the war are now definitely obsolete. The tank for the future must be able to withstand greater punishment, be more reliable, and have improved hitting power. The present tanks are much too slow and too vulnerable to anti-tank weapons. The key player in this idea was the commander of the 1st Tank Battalion at Peleliu, Arthur J. Stewart, which was witness to a Japanese armored counterattack directly onto the beach. The action, while unsuccessful in driving the Americans on the shore, had brought to light the poor anti-tank performance of the tank crews in the Pacific Theater. He noted, 
Had the Japanese possessed modern tanks instead of the tankettes and had attacked in greater numbers, the situation would have been critical. Now, the reason I am telling you this is because the U.S. Marine Corps had developed a doctrine of amphibious warfare early on, which had called for the initial deployment of tanks directly onto the beachhead. Pre-war, before the invention of proper landing craft, this took the form of a 5-ton light tank to support the ground troops and destroy the machine gun nests that enemy fortifications would entirely consist of, then to be followed up by a medium tank of 10 tons to carry the battle inland, and eventually to be followed up by a 15-20-ton to 20 ton vehicle armed with something resembling an actual cannon to help further support the battle inland. This doctrine was adapted during World War II to have the light tank M3 Stuart come ashore to deal with enemy fortifications to be followed up by M4 Shermans to carry the fight inland. However, at Tarawa in February of 1943, the light tanks failed miserably and were replaced in that role by the battle tank M4. So now there was quite simply no difference between the landing force and the follow-on forces in terms of armor. So naturally, the Marine Corps decided that the medium tanks would now become the initial landing force, and follow-on tanks would have to be heavy tanks, to which the Marine Corps put out a requirement and purchased a few N26 Pershings as substitute standard vehicles while they waited for the army to quit twiddling their thumbs and adopt something new. And indeed, it was this requirement for a heavy tank in the Marine Corps which would ensure the heavy tank M103 would actually see the light of day. So how did the M103's development begin? Well, it started when the US Army decided to reject the T-34 heavy tank based on its exceedingly heavy weight of 70 tons, which led to poor mobility and maneuverability characteristics. In 1948, a group of conferences were held at the Detroit Tank Arsenal, which produced a design that was supposed to give a 2.85 horsepower per ton increase to mobility, while also shaving off 14.5 tons. This was effectively a shortened and smaller T-34. This was also the point which the army ditched the assistant driver's position and the whole machine gun, which allowed the driver to be placed center line in the vehicle, and also made room for an advanced elliptical reshaping of the hull, which was done by engineer Joseph Williams later on. The T-53E1 120mm gun also received a redesign, designated T-122, which was essentially the same gun, but 15% lighter and with an increased chamber pressure from 38,000 PSI to 48,000 PSI which effectively determines how powerful of a propellant you can put behind the projectile. In addition, by using cold working techniques, another gun using a minimum 100,000 PSI strength steel was built and designated T-123. These two guns would compete for adoption on the new tank, and on December 1st, 1948, the Ordnance Technical Committee presented Heavy Tank Program T-43 as a feasible design ready to be developed. From Ken Estes' book, he states, the new tank was to weigh 58 tons combat loaded, carry a crew of four, present five inches of frontal hull and turret armor plus a four inch gun shield, yet reach a speed of 27 miles per hour with its 810 AV 1790 series 12 cylinder gasoline engine. After a few months of endorsements and reviews by the U.S. General Staff, the Project T-43 was approved for development and production of pilot vehicles on May 19, 1949. However, not everybody was satisfied with this decision, mainly the transportation branch of the logistics division, which was concerned that the new vehicle would not be suitable for the current rail transport systems, and the Army General Staff was unsure if the new burdens placed on local industry would allow for the introduction of such a vehicle into active service. Luckily, the Ordnance Technical Committee meetings had two important advocates of the heavy tank in attendance. Representing the Marine Corps, we had Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Stewart and Major General O.P. Smith, which were the same two guys which had pointed out the complete inadequacy of the Marine Corps tank arm in the two quotes we mentioned earlier. In addition, these men also received support from the Army in the form of Lieutenant Colonel Walter B. Richardson, which was an experienced tank commander from the U.S. 3rd Armored Division during World War II. These three men would ensure that the Army got its heavy tank. It was also around this time that the tank destroyer force was scrapped and set to be replaced by heavy tank battalions. This meant that for every armored division, there was a requirement for 69 T-43 heavy tanks. And if you do a little math, if the army ever needed to mobilize a 64 division force to fight World War III, the army would need a grand total of 11,529 heavy tanks. To put this in perspective, the Germans only ever built around 12 to 1300 Tigers in the entirety of the Second World War. Development would continue through 1949 until a new set of characteristics were agreed upon, published and then approved on June 28, 1950. These changes raised the overall height of the vehicle while giving it lower ground clearance. Other changes included the incorporation of Engineer Williams elliptical cast hull design and turret, as well as increasing the turret ring diameter to 85 inches and added a second loader to the crew in order to stand in for unavailable auto-loading machinery. 
The concentric recoil cylinder, remote controlled MG blisters, a direct fire telescope, commander's panoramic sight, and a lead computer were also deleted in this process. This space created by the deletion of the direct fire telescope allowed the installation of a second coaxial machine gun. An electrical loader safety was added to force the second loader to stand clear of the breach in order to clear the gun to fire, and the commander received a new set of gun controls with which he could override the gunner and lay the gun onto a new target and even fire if deemed necessary. These, in addition with other small changes, slowed down the progress of the production pilot vehicles. It was during this time where Ordnance obtained approval for the development of the two new lightweight 120mm anti-tank guns that we mentioned earlier as T-122 and T-123 in February of 1950. The T-122 used standard manufacturing processes, while the T-123 used cold working techniques. It was also about this time that the People's Republic of Korea so rudely decided to invade its southern neighbor and kick off what we now know as the Korean War. This kicked off the infamous U.S. tank panic in which we were forced to enter the Korean War with a mess of old World War II production equipment and without the new family of tanks that the U.S. and Marines so desperately wanted. Essentially, this is what happened. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! What's the Everybody procedure, everyone? Calm. What's the procedure? Stay f***ing calm! Wait, 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 wait! Everybody f calm down! This resulted in the U.S. Army declaring a crash program to advance and produce the new tank designs by any means necessary. Unfortunately for Project T-43, it only existed in wood at the time the Korean War broke out, and as a result was not going to be ready in time for the Korean War. It was also about this time that the Army started to have doubts as to the practicality of the heavy tank. There was currently a three-way competition between the infantry, armor, and ordnance branches over the T-42 medium tank, with the infantry requesting greater anti-tank capability from the M3 90mm cannon. In light of this, a series of exchanges between Stewart and Richardson confirmed Stewart's fear that the Army was heavily considering canceling the T-43 program altogether. Stewart then quickly urged his heavy tank superiors in the Marine Corps to assert their requirements very quickly. However, help came from an unlikely source inside the Army. General Clark, commanding a brigade in Germany at the outbreak of the Korean War, had made several appeals to the Army to begin immediate production of heavy tanks in order to equip the U.S. Army in case of a Soviet attack in Western Europe. Eventually, the Army gave in and sent an order to Chrysler Motors Plant in Newark, Delaware for 80 T-43 pilots for a troop test in December of 1950 for $500,000 a vehicle. Needless to say, things didn't go according to plan. Even before these vehicles rolled off the production line, the Army recognized that the vehicles themselves required a minimum of 68 different modifications to be even remotely ready for troop trials. These modifications led to the T-43E1 being developed. In addition to this, two vehicles were diverted to become T-43E2 pilots, which grew the list of modifications to 144 in December of 1955. Eventually, this number was narrowed down to 114 modifications. Meanwhile, Continental Army Command, or CONARC, successor to Army Ground Forces, had completed testing of T-43E1 tanks and concluded that they sucked. As a result, the entire existing production lot of T-43E1s got stuck into storage, awaiting upgrades to the T-43E2 standard. The failure of T-43 was down to rushed production and experiences during the Korean War, which had caused the cancellation of the T-42 medium tank project and replacing it with the T-48, which would evolve into the M-48, using much of the T-43 design concepts in its construction. Problems with the T-43E1 included, but were not limited to, issues with the turret controls, gun pointing and training system, fire control system, and power plant. Basically everything. In addition to the need for a direct fire telescope as a backup, the addition of a turret basket that rotated with the two loaders to avoid the turret monster, and the moving of the gunner forwards from the rear of the turret next to the commander to the area just right of the gun to make the gunner's job easier, as well as a few other additions, eventually led to T-43E2. The problem was that by 1955 there was also a lack of urgency for a new heavy tank now that the Korean War and its tank crisis had passed. This resulted in the adoption of T-43E1 with only 96 out of the 114 recommended modifications by the Army as tank, combat, full-tracked, 120mm gun M103 on February 26th of 1956. As a side note, the turret monster is a mythical creature that lives inside the tank that has a nasty habit of grabbing whatever it possibly can as the turret rotates. Usually things you need, like your radio codebook, your maps, and occasionally limbs. It's not very picky. But going back to the adoption. In one of the largest cases of the U.S. Marine Corps saying that they are taking their ball and going home, they promptly refused the M103 in its Army-adopted state. They then pushed the Army to finish what the dam started, and wanted their 220 vehicles to be produced to T-43E2 standards. 
On March 28, 1957, the Commandant of the Marine Corps notified the Army Chief of Staff that he was satisfied by the Army's test results, reported earlier that month, and determined that the T-43E2 was suitable for combat use. He then, as stated previously, requested modification of all 220 U.S. Marine Corps heavy tanks to T-43E2 standards and adopted the vehicle with the designation M103A1 on May 17th of 1957. Despite its adoption, however, the ammunition development had been slow and still required a little bit more work. Speaking of the ammunition, the Army continued development of the ammunition types for the T-122 and T-123E1 120mm guns during the entire T-43 debacle. The developments with ammunition led to the T-116E5 and its series of improvements such as adding a rubber obturator to the base of the shell to create a gas seal as the round was propelled down the barrel, as well as different materials such as high-strength aluminum alloys used in different windshield ballistic cap designs. This eventually led to T-116E7, which was adopted for use as 120mm armor-piercing tracer M358 in January of 1957. Also, I should take the time to mention here, since I realized post-editing that I did mention what gun was adopted, the Army would eventually adopt the T-123E1 as its M58 120mm cannon. However, both the high-explosive and armor-piercing rounds caused massive bore erosion problems that were so acute that the bore life was as little as 150 AP rounds and 500 AG rounds. But the last most difficult ammunition to perfect was the high-velocity heat rounds, which could, in theory, penetrate over 15 inches mm, of rolled homogeneous armor. The round went through a ton of inconsistent tests, with some achieving incredible accuracy with as little as 0.16 mils or 0.54 MOA of dispersion at 100 yards. Other tests, however, had fin defects and improper fusing upon impact, causing other accuracy and penetration problems. As a result, the Army spent another year perfecting the round, getting it up to a staggering 15 different variants before it was finally withdrawn from service as the M469 Heat FS round. With both the M103 and the M103A1 in service, the Marine Corps continued to operate their M103A1s through the Cuban Missile Crisis. During this period, Heavy Tanks of C Company, 2nd Battalion of the 2nd Marine Division, was deployed to Guantanamo Bay every six months along with two flame tanks to exercise and man a two-tank guard post in a massive middle finger to the Cuban government. This gesture was justified by the presence of Soviet IS-2s, SU-100s, and T-55 medium tanks in the area. This proved to be the sole overseas use of the U.S. Marine Corps M103A1. The last modification of the M103 came with the Army's adoption of the M60 main battle tank and its new diesel engine. To simplify logistics, the Army decided to modify their existing M103s to use the M60's diesel engine, as well as incorporate many of the U.S. Marine Corps' improvements from the A1. Other changes included changing the rainfinder from stereoscopic to coincidence. Coincidence is far easier to use, you just line up two images and then you get your range. The driver's hatch received the M60 operating handle, and the operator's panel for the driver was being replaced with one that corresponds to the M60. The U.S. Marine Corps shortly followed by being granted authorization to bring 143 service and three pilots up to M103A2 standards for a total of 146 M103A2s in service with the U.S. Marine Corps. So how did the vehicle actually fare? Well, it was a fairly popular with the troops, who quite simply loved its ability to blow up anything they pointed their gun at. Driving was as easy as the medium tanks, and although it weighed 64 tons, with the new engine and increased fuel capacity, it could still climb the same hills and forded the same stream beds as before. The tank would continue in service with the U.S. military until 1972 when it was retired. In conclusion, the tank was powerful and well-liked overall but its long and troubled development program led it to falling out of favor with the army that began its development, who instead began to favor the cheaper and less problematic medium tanks. With the developments of firepower and the adoption of the 105mm M68 gun, which is the L7-105 produced under license in the United States, the army now had the capability to potentially match the M103 in terms of firepower, especially with its later variants and ammunition improvements. In short, the heavy tank was on its way out, and the new vehicle, the main battle tank concept, sought to bring firepower that was once reserved for heavy tanks to medium tank chassis in a far more economic package. And with that, I will end part two of three of the gun tank concept series. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to watch this video, with more to come in the future. Next up, we complete the gun tank series with the British answer to the IS-3, Conqueror. Sources are listed in the description below, and have a nice day everyone.